So that is a scale-up programmer. You know, the, um, how many of you guys have heard of Scala? Yeah. <laughs> you know what Scala the language is. You know, it's not a card. Uh, we just discovered that there's a card. It's also known as a Scala. It's very, very new. So, so that's a Scala programmer who does JavaScript. And he's going to come to the perspective of saying that as someone who's not one of those kinds who grew up speaking JavaScript as a native you know, uh, how do you actually use the language in a way that works? Because for someone who's really good at JavaScript, you tend to know your way around. You know, you know the magic is like you know what to do, what not to do, and um, you tend to treat it as second nature. Uh, what is that going to bring in is a perspective of how do you do this as someone who's not actually doing JavaScript full time, but who's new to the language and essentially learning. Uh, learning to figure out where the pitfalls are, you know, exactly what works, what doesn't work. So he's going to talk about how to write good JavaScript. So uh, I'm going to ask a question that. Uh, no, it's, it's a, is it too loud? I'm just guessing. So I'm going to go ahead and ask a question that uh, Sunil asked earlier. Can you just tell me how many of you guys have, have used JavaScript before? Uh, a little more force because it's kind of hard to see. Can you just just out yes? How many of you guys used JavaScript before? Yes. A little louder, I can't really hear you. Yes. Okay, quite a few of them. That's good. Uh, so, what? I'll just do a quick check now. Technology, not one of my skills. I know I'm in the IT industry, but I have no idea how these things work. Uh, the other thing is, I tend to speak fast at times. So, if I start speaking fast, just tell me, warn me, just have to slow down or something like that. Uh, if you don't understand anything I'm saying, just let me know because that happens quite often too. So, really, if you don't understand, it's my fault. So, don't, don't tell me a bad, just go ahead and tell me. Uh, okay, this is a very good thing. So, I'm just going to change from what Jay said. So, uh, even if you know how to program JavaScript and you're good at it, you should be doing these things. You should be using these tools. I'm just going to introduce you to two tools which I think are, uh, in my opinion, critical. Uh, while you're developing JavaScript. One is any sort of unit testing tool. I'm going to talk about Jasmine a bit. And the other is something that uh, Sunil Bhai had sort of pointed towards. There's this guy called Douglas Crockford who used to work in Yahoo, who uh, who sort of took JavaScript and uh, it's Watts and said, okay, let's just simplify this thing a bit, uh, simplify this a bit and make it uh, easier to use and make it more reliable. And he, uh, he wrote this book called JavaScript, The Good Paths. But he also built a tool that you can use, so you don't have to read that book. Uh, it's called JSLint, and I'm actually going to also talk about that a bit. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and uh, first start off by introducing Jasmine here. Uh, so Jasmine is basically a unit testing tool. Uh, 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 how many of you guys have actually uh, written unit tests? Oh, not many. I <laughs> uh, I I would suggest you consider doing a writing test for your code because it tends to provide a, a couple of very important advantages. One, it lets you make sure that any you, you end up writing tests anywhere when you are writing a code. You make sure you put it into some kind of place where it stays for a long time. Uh, it acts as documentation to a certain extent. And also when you go tomorrow and decide to modify your code, it makes it a lot easier. There's also this third slightly more insidious uh, advantage of uh, tests in that it forces you to think about your code in advance rather than wait till the last moment. Normally you just keep typing and then hope like hell it works. But because you write tests, it sort of provides a, a, a good safety system for making you think about what you're going to do. Uh, so I'm just going to give you an example of a very simple test here. So I, 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 I want to write a, com a function multiply. And uh, all it does is basically multiplies to numbers. And uh, I hope... Uh, so, one second. I'm going to try and... Minimize this a bit and see if this becomes more clear. Click the green full screen button. Huh? Okay, I've never done that. Top, top left, yeah. No, it's already full screen. Uh, oh no. Okay, so this is better. Uh, so this is a uh, common data, JSN. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the test has failed. And it's kind of obvious why it's failed. But the, but the nice thing is now that I've recorded this here, uh, normally what I'd end up doing is write the function, test it, then realize it's broken, and then test it again. So now I can write the test once, and all I have to do is basically go ahead and modify this function here. Uh, I'll run you through the, uh, obviously not minus, but uh, multiply. Uh, 
and uh, it, it can test this for me. Unfortunately, there's some bug in my code which I thought I'd fix and make it happen twice, but ignore that. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, the other advantage of uh, this stuff you notice is it actually helps you ha help generate uh, fairly readable test messages. So I can see a multiply, multiply function should uh, return 10 when given 5 and 2, and that makes it a lot easier. Okay, this case is a bit silly, but let's say you write a really complex class or something like that, it makes it a lot easier to actually uh, read uh, what your code is doing. And like I told you, this whole documentation aspect, it also lets you know uh, in your documentation exactly what your function is supposed to do. Because you can actually write this down here. I mean, your test generated down, not your programmer documentation, which should be separate, and you should be doing that too. Uh, so I'll just go for a slightly more uh, complex test here. So this is something uh, I'm actually regretting, because uh, it's something that is in some code that I wrote. And I realized it's a bit silly in terms of uh, uh, what it does, because it kind of bit messed up, but I won't get into that. Uh, the point is that if you use, if you want to do a maximum of an array in, in, in JavaScript, uh, you have to have, you can't have an empty array, but there's a lot of times that you really want to test, let's say an empty array, uh, you want to test against uh, an empty array, so you want to give it some sort of optional value that it falls back to. So I wrote a functional array max, it's fairly simple. Uh, now, uh, again, this code basically, if it's zero, then it should, it should fail. It should, it should actually just return the minimum value, otherwise try and calculate the max using the, the rest of the values, okay? Uh, so I just want to quickly go through how you write test cases here. Basically, I just, I just first decide to describe uh, what my, uh, the, my test is about, uh, and it's about this method called Arimax. And uh, then again, I, I decide to write what it does. Uh, the, the good thing again, like I mentioned earlier, this whole whole auto documentation that generates for me in, in the form of the test, so I can go back and see how, how the function is going to behave. In the form that now I know that it should return the largest number when given an array, it should return a default value. Uh, let's say for some reason uh, I messed this up and uh, this line unfortunately I comment is not too much, but I will return 0 here for fun. And now it's basically got two failures. It's saying that, or oh, the one failure, to make sure. Yes, basically. Yeah, two failures that happened. And it lets me know that basically uh, it should return a value, default value if the, if, the, if the length is zero. In which case, which I said to actually, it's supposed to be uh, minus infinity. So this test is basically failing. Uh, oh, sorry, it was the default value if uh, I provide the default value. I provide 10 and it turns 0 instead. And it returned uh, minus infinity when I provided uh, uh, 0. But now the issue is obviously the problem with test case, and I want to mention this, is the test cases don't catch all your issues. They'll only catch things that have been defined in your test. And, and this is particularly true when you talk about, let's say, even simple algorithms like this one here. Uh, but in most, most, most places, it actually still makes sense to write these tests because what you can do is when you see a new bug in your system, you can actually go and add it as another test into your test case. And uh, the uh, second thing I want to sort of just sort of glance on is this whole notion that this the test also acts as kind of a specification for your class. So uh, if you're sort of slightly more TDD driven, then you can sort of start thinking, okay, what is my class? And I can write that down and then sort of decide my test based on that and then go ahead and, and implement my tests. It's not a very bad model for certain types of tasks. I don't recommend it for everything, but it still helps. Uh, so I'm just going to move on to uh, a third aspect of uh, of tests. Um, so one of the things that you end up doing a lot in, in JavaScript is, is using callbacks uh, quite heavily. And uh, so th this is sort of place where you really need to send an object into another object. And then what happens, you don't want to send, let's say, a real object, which is a, a business object into that system because it's going to be very hard for you to set up things and all that. So what you can do is you can fake function calls in, uh, quite easily using uh, mocks and uh, what this library I use is called it calls it uh, spies and you can just go ahead and implement these things. So what what this basically does is I, I have a function that basically a command object. So what a command object is basically I want to wrap a particular piece of behavior and then be able to pass it to somebody else, another object in the system, and I want a, a general interface for this. So no matter where I where wherever it's passed, it just calls that method and, and the behavior is pretty much consistent. 
uh, this is standard Oopsie thing. Uh, I mean, it's even the overkill for, for this purpose. I actually removed a lot of other methods from this, but uh, you can just pass a function only. But I'm just going to use that in this case. Uh, so what, now what I'm doing is basically I, I, I can go ahead and define a new command object. It has a name which I'm not using, and it has, it, I'm passing a callback. The callback is basically this operation called as pi. And uh, I can just go ahead and execute this command. Now what happens when I execute this command? Uh, the callback is executed here. And uh, the, the library that I'm using actually records this information and I can actually go ahead and check has this thing been called. And it, it then goes ahead and uh, passes the test for me. And this is, this is kind of, uh, I, I'm not very fond of using uh, these kind of code because it's very hard to track the behavior but a lot of time you have to do it. And uh, it makes, makes things a lot easier. Uh, okay, so this is basically an introduction testing. Uh, I, I want, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions here or if it made any sense at all. Uh, first one. Essentially, uh, creating spies out of ways to do uh, mocking, basically. Async testing, yeah. Uh, not really. So, it, it, I mean, you, it, it's JavaScript, so it, I mean, it's not going to be asynchronous, uh, at least for testing, because it's going to be inconvenient. It's the only way of, let's say that the use case is that I have uh, an object and I have another object that I'm passing to it or a function, okay? Now I'm calling this function inside my code but this, this function is actually something that is coming from outside from another, from another environment. So I have no control over the behavior of this. So how do I test this? I, I need to pass something in to test. So what I do is that I pass a fake, semi-fake object which when called basically records that it was called. It also records the, if, if the, any parameters were passed to it, it records what parameters were passed to it. So I can then go and check whether it was called, what parameters were passed to it, and then I can I can know that the behavior was what I expected. So any other questions before I move on? This is a very, very quiet audience. Uh, do we have some debugger kind of thing for this, uh, so that we can uh, put the breakpoints or something? So uh, debuggers work anyway. So I mean, uh, I mean JavaScript supports debuggers anyway. So you can, I mean. Th so by the way, so this is a fake environment. So uh, these are, this is, I just plug them together. So you can use this without using whatever I've done So normally, what you end up doing is either if you're working in, uh, I should mention this earlier. Thanks. Uh, if you're if you're if you're using uh, this in production, you'd either run it using your build tools. So you can have once once your code is once you type the code, you can have a script that runs this thing for you. You can output it directly to the command line, or you can have it generate a web page of of your uh, of your tests, and that's really up to how you want to display these things. Uh, uh, I just plug this in here, so it's just easy for me to sort of show you both things in parallel. Normally, I would not work like this. I'd probably use an IDE or an editor to to, to do the stuff, and then and, and then run it. Can you please elaborate on that ID thing so that um, actual whatever thing is going on, you can know by putting the breakpoint, okay? some sort of breakpoint procedure. Okay, so I, I, there are two. Okay, since you asked about breakpoint, there are two ways uh, you can do breakpoints. The easiest way is basically just like Visual Studio provides uh, breakpoints. So I'm just going to show you. Is it is it debugger or breakpoint? I can't remember. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, actually, JavaScript uh, provides something uh, a command called debugger, okay. and you should consider using that if you want to. Uh, instead of breakpoint without actually going to the, the other editor. I, I'll have to start up the developer tool which uh, I was showing to you earlier. Ah, I got two inputs, but it's done. So this is the debugger, this is the debugger tool that uh, I talked about earlier. So what I can do is I can insert a, I can use insert a command called debugger in the browser, something JavaScript provides. I hope it's called debugger, it's called Breakpoints. Okay, so what's happening? So this is a cool thing. So you can actually just go ahead and jump into into the code directly by just putting this command. In. The other option is uh, so I just want to show you this because I use this more often than actually doing the other way. Uh, so now I can basically see what are variables are there in this function. For example, I can hover over command. It shows me exactly what it does. So what what is the of? The other option, which uh, sorry, I'm in the wrong view. Is let's go to ah, ah, to the windows. Ah, uh, oh Quit the debugger. Press play. No, I will not Yeah, I will do that. Uh, okay. So move the. Oh, it's not.
important. Don't ask me why. There's a bug in my code. Uh, so I can remove this guy. And uh, instead of doing that, I'll go to the source. Uh, just the I can go to say, uh, this, uh, so I can I have this open now, and I can actually I want I want to get this one because that's kind of pushing it. So I can go ahead and maybe put uh, a breakpoint into my code directly. For example, I can put one when my app starts around here. Like that's actually my code. Let's put it here. Okay, that's, that's interesting because that's where the first declaration happens. So now what I can do is, I can actually go back to the page, uh, do a refresh, and I can I can do that. So uh, so the, the, the nice thing about uh, developer tools in for the web right now is they're pretty incredible. So you can do pretty much everything that you want to do with uh, with uh, your IDs in the browser. Though actually if you pick up a, a decent uh, Java ID, you get the debugger support inside the ID itself. So if you're more comfortable, that way you can edit your code and uh, debug in the same space. But if you want to just debug in the browser, you can do that too. Uh, both options are available. So I'll just get back. Uh, any other questions I before I move on? Uh, so I, I, know, I know this might sound silly and uh, very trivial, but I would seriously recommend investing time in exploring unit tests and using them while developing. So I, I'm not kidding about this. It, it really improves your code quality considerably. So okay, I'll move on to the next one, which is uh, yeah, there was a big part of this. Uh, okay, so uh, so the, the one of the one of the big issues uh, if you work in JavaScript uh, in, in in any sort of reasonably sized. Uh, project, or even if you're just done a bit of dabbling, is that JavaScript tends to have a lot of these gotchas in, it, in the sense that you can do certain things you expect to behave in a certain way, uh, it doesn't. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, this guy called Douglas talked about active and sat down and said, okay, let me try and simplify uh, what bits of JavaScript, uh, or at least help people realize what bits of JavaScript are safe to use and what bits of JavaScript are not. So he built this tool called JSNet, and while he built this tool, he also added certain other aspects that I'm kind of fond of, which is he sort of added information like, for example, add your coding standards. So it also checks your coding standards. It checks uh, a whole bunch of stuff to make sure that your code is both reliable and clean and easy to read for other people. So it's worth investing in, and you don't really don't have to understand why uh, a lot of these things work. It's enough to actually use the tool, and it solves a lot of problems. It, it adds an incredible amount of reliability to your code just by doing uh, by using this tool. So uh, if you look here, I've, I've written a small function, uh, a small uh, bit of code, which basically has a global variable. Uh, so how many of you guys are comfortable with uh, uh, with uh, this bit of code here, where I'm not use a var statement? Do you guys write code like this, or do you always make sure you use vars? Uh, or do you understand this? What's happening? Put your side effects, you don't use a var. Uh, more importantly, this uh, variable leaks out to the top. Yeah, it's hoisted. So I just want to understand because I, I need to understand where I'm going with this before I move forward. Uh, do you understand what the issue with this piece of code is? Yeah. I'll just try yeah, yeah, this one bit here. You haven't declared your variable. No, I have a crawl button. Uh, after this. Okay? Uh, so I'm just, I'm doing this. Okay, so what, what would this. Uh, what would this function do? Uh, this piece of code here. What did the result do? Pardon? Four. Okay. Uh, so we just execute this. I'm just going to change this to all of them. So it prints four. Now I'm going to make this change here. Alright? Uh, I'm going to ask you. So, what what is this print now? Five. 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 So, you guys are comfortable with this. So, if I it's it's uh, important to put this in, and now it's five. Okay. So, the reason is that if you put a var in front of your uh, uh, variable declaration, in, uh, variable call, it's actually a declaration. It says that this variable is only visible within this function scope, and it's not visible outside. 
Whereas if I do a is equal to 5, it's, it's not only is it visible uh, uh, in this function scope, it's actually visible throughout the entire JavaScript application. It's not a very good thing to do. It actually abides it through the document object window object, actually, but that's the other part. Uh, it's not a very clean way of doing things. So you generally want to make sure that your functions are, the scope of your functions are restricted and not uh, spread out. Because what happens is, uh, let's say uh, somebody writes a function which has this global variable in there called a. Now tomorrow somebody else writes another function which also has a variable called a and they both have the same name and they do two different things. And now suddenly let's say uh, one side is got a security message supposed to be printed, the other side a prints this message saying hello how are you doing, it's going to create a lot of confusion. So because that it tends to make sense not to use global variables and the nice thing about JSLint, if you, I'll just show you this document, it actually fusses about a lot of the stuff. So JSLint actually insists that I put this use strict on top. Uh, use strict is another thing that actually makes sense because it sort of restricts a lot of behavior in uh, in JavaScript including uh, reading a global variable without actually de uh, assigning, declaring it first. Uh, it it's definitely makes a lot of sense. So I'm just going to go ahead and start demonstrating. So now it's a little bit of formatting issues. It's sort of expected to put a space somewhere. I'm not sure where. Yeah. Oh, here. Okay. And uh, okay, so here's something I've done because of it expects. You can control these things, but I've set it for spaces instead of tabs. And here it's sort of passing that this A was used before it was defined. So it sort of tells you you can't do this. And uh, if you're in strict mode, actually the, the, the browser will also complain about, complain about this sort of stuff. So <coughs> I'm just going to put var A here and refresh it. Uh, so yeah, so now obviously a couple of things are going to happen. Var A is only going to be visible in this particular scope. This var, this var no longer conflicts with this one, so that's kind of nice again. So you get a lot more cleanness. So a slightly more uh, longer example of uh, uh, variables here. So I'm going to do this in two steps. So first of all, uh, here I've declared a variable called a. I've got a variable called a of assigned to 4. And then I'm just going to basically, in the beginning, I try to print the value of a, it prints, obviously, there's no value, so I think that's undefined. And then uh, I assign it to uh, 6. I assign a 4, so it prints 4. I assign a 6, it prints 6. I assign it to 7, so it should print 7. Okay, so this is kind of uh, trivial. But JS yes, starts complaining about a lot of stuff. Obviously, the first thing it says is this use strict. Uh, then it sort of complains about this particular case, which is A was used before it was defined. Uh, so I, I, I need to basically move this here. It also passes about one more thing. Actually, no, I need to move uh, this to a bar A. Okay. It also passes about uh, this uh, bar A being defined twice. So then you have to sort of, you can only have one, it sort of insists that you only have one uh, bar definition in your uh, in your uh, function. Uh, there, now there, there's, there, there's good reason for this, okay, because now that, and I'll actually just sort of demonstrate one of them right now. Uh, you might ask why, why, why do you want to have, why can't I have a declare var where I'm going to use the variable? That's, that's probably the most sensible thing. Uh, but it sort of insists that you sort of declare the, the variable once on top. So I'm just going to refresh this thing. Uh, oh. So I'm going to ask you a couple of things. What do you think log that message A will print? 10. 10? Not bad. You guys are better than me. Uh, the reason I asked is because we noticed there's a A is equal to 4 I declared in the set of function without any bar before all the other uh, stuff. So, okay, so you guys are. So what's happening here is, uh, I'll just run this. Okay, they, so this is something that confuses me. Okay, so I'm, I'm quite happy that you guys realize this. So uh, if I declare a var inside the inside the variable anywhere in the scope, it sort of decides that any declaration of the value a, even if it appears before the var, is going to be treated as a variable in that context. So now if I want to move these lines, and because I want to move the var statements, okay. Now if I run this, it sort of prints 4 because uh, it's now using the A, it's using this A that was declared here and not the A here. So this is not exactly, I mean you can write, if you're writing 
a reason you can be convoluted in piece of code. It's not going to be obvious, you know, which which context you're using the A from. And that can really lead to a lot of confusion. So it actually makes sense to sort of move your declaration up here, where it actually is most visible. And not have them all over the place, like I was doing earlier. So now it's kind of obvious, okay, now, now we know that this this var was basically declared here and then they started using it again. Uh, I just got one more example of this stuff. Okay, so this is something that's uh, written here a few times. I'm embarrassed a bit, but it happens often enough that I, I think it's a good example of stuff. So now this guy is uh, kind of pass about right, not one. It's called push. I know I got it right. Okay, so uh, this, again, it's going to pass about a certain amount of formatting. So let's get that out of the way. Okay, so now this is a really silly thing. Why can't I put functions at a loop? Okay, I want to do it. Why is this talking from doing this? So now the question is what is this print? What I'm doing here is I've got a library from. I from 1 to 10, I'm creating a bunch of uh, functions which are basically bound to I and uh, I'm adding it to the list here. So what should this print and then I'm calling the function one after the other. So what should this print? It's printing, it's calling those functions after the current number. Print from 0 to 9. Yeah, it's interesting. Right? Let's check. Okay, what happened here? Okay, so this is this is why you don't want to do this. So this is why uh, JS Lin said, please do not put functions inside your stuff. So what's happening here is uh, this is a variable that's always going to be uh, it's been bound here, it's been declared here. Now what's going to happen is uh, it's this guy is being bound to this variable i. Every function that's system be bound to the variable i. Okay, but i is being incremented over that time. So by the end of this thing, all these functions are still pointing to the same variable i, but they are now being incremented or they are pointing to the value, the i's value is not 10. So when you actually print it, it becomes 10. So the sensible thing would be to, to do would be to take this function, I'm going to create uh, what they call a generator, I guess, I don't know what the technical term is, function, okay, uh, id gen, okay, id. And here we will return the original function. And I think we renamed it to ID and it was not an ID. And this guy insists on semicolon, so we put a semicolon here. And we'll do ID then. I'm a Java programmer, so I tend to put capital letters. Sort of mixed up. I don't know what I'm doing. So, okay? Let's go back. Okay. So, uh, now what's going to happen here? I'm going to explain to you. Uh, this ID is going to be this 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 ID gen is basically going to create uh, a return a new function. But uh, how how uh, I may be aware of closures, which uh, were mentioned earlier. This function is going to get returned. We'll always remember what our variable was set here. So now when we call this thing, we're going to ID gen of the ID. It will basically start generating. Uh, each function will have its own copy of the ID because it's, it's this variable not. I, which was uh, looped over, and so now when we when we call this thing, we should. I mean, if all things work fine, get zero out of it. Okay. So this is this is again. Now okay. Now this guy is passing about other problems, which are brackets and stuff. Which here. Yeah. Uh, this one. There's one more out there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> So, so the, actually, the thing about JSON can actually get some serious issues in the code. And uh, and what I showed you right now is not something that is pulled out from the backside. This is something that I have faced in the past. And after using JSON, a colleague of mine actually sort of came across this. And he said, you know, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to ignore JSON. And uh, half an hour later, he said, oh, this code is not working. And I say, why don't you just listen to JSON? It would have, it would have saved you a lot of time. So it is actually quite productive to look at this. It makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about one more thing. Uh, this is my favorite part. So, uh, it's, it's if I had mentioned uh, functional programming earlier, and I'm a big fan of that. So, I'm going to try and sell you 
concept of having it, why you should do it and why it's beneficial, why it makes your code a lot easier to read and a lot easier to code. Uh, there is this incredibly cool library available online called underscore.js and I recommend having a look at that. Uh, I'm going to be using that in my next example. Um, getting function. So, here's a simple problem. Okay, ignore this one. Because I'm not, I'm not, I wrote this while you're the talk, okay? Uh, okay, so, I have a text file uh, which I've basically pushed in. Uh, I can share the text file, some, some short story I found out there. And uh, I've decided I want to count the words in there and I want to basically sum up. So what I did was I, I written a small function. This is not important. Basically, not a function to uh, pass the thing. If you know the Excel, basically this just takes all letter characters, extracts them out, and then I create an array of these things. So this is kind of not good, but this is the slightly more interesting thing. Um, I will actually shift off the. Alright, can you see this? <coughs> so, uh, words of thing, all it does is it basically takes a, a, an array of a list of words and uh, takes, a, takes a, a string, any string, and then extracts all the words from it and creates a list of them. So, this is kind of trivial, it's not too hard. Uh, so, uh, but underscore, now the problem is how do I now go ahead and count these words? I could probably go ahead and create a uh, hash map and then go add them one by one. Uh, what uh, what uh, underscore provides is a really cool function called group by. So what group by does is it takes a list and then it takes a function as a parameter. Uh, what it does is each element of the list it will pass to the function and then this function will return a particular value which will act as a key in a in a object or a hash map or you know what you normally call them. Uh, which and then every element in this original list will be added if, if, the, if they have the same key they will be added as a list element into this particular list. For example, let's do a simple case of uh, let's uh, I'm just going to quickly show you what card. So above all of this, I'm just going to put I have a list Okay. Uh, so, this is going to be a really silly one. Okay? Uh, I'm just going to split, uh, I'm going to create a, a, a list of the even numbers and the odd numbers. So, how I'm going to do that is, I'm going to say underscore dot group by L, and my function is basically going to be. N mod okay. And actually, what's the thing? Uh, now I'm going to do this case picture on the screen. Because uh, object, I'm going to do a JSON plus two. Let me make this a little more easier. Okay, so <laughs> kind of silly. Basically, uh, this function basically returned n mod two. So uh, all it did was return uh, n mod two. So it, it created one key with a value of zero, another key with a value of one, and then basically took all the all the numbers that uh, n mod two was uh, two zero and put them here. And all the values that the n mod uh, two or uh, one put them here. So kind of kind of now this is kind of trivial here. But what I what I've done is I take the words. I say for each of these each of these elements, if the, if the word is the same, then just add it to this. Now it, it seems a bit silly. It's a bit inefficient, but it's sort of it's easier to write and it runs fast enough to not really bother. Uh, okay. So that's what. Uh, 
That's what uh, the group I So now I have a list of, uh, uh, a list of words with the uh, uh, basically an array with the words and then a list of the same same words after that. Okay. So now how, to count it, all I need to do is now find the list, list length of each of those lists, and that will give me the word count. So for that, I need to first of all get the keys of the array. So I, uh, so underscore provides me a function that given an object will give me the keys of that object, and then I use this operator called map, which I'll talk about. And what map does is basically uh, takes a list of any elements and then calls a function of each of those elements. So basically I have a bunch of keys now. So then W is each of those keys. And then I just basically say return the count, which since the this object has a list of that word in there, the count of that is the length. The length of that list is going to be the number of words in that of that type. Okay? And then the name of the word so I can know what word it was. Now obviously I need to sort it, so again I use underscore provides me a method that I can sort by a particular uh, uh, particular field. So in my case I want to sort by, sort by the count. Uh, now the problem is, underscore, sort by is going to sort in ascending order and I want to get the largest number, so I want to sort in descending order, so I just multiply by minus 1. And that returns me the uh, sorted count in reverse order. Uh, obviously slice, I, I guess you all have used, basically I'm just slice getting the top 10 elements. And then this, I'm just going to print them uh, using uh, another method called for each, which lets me say iterate over this thing. Uh, for each and map, I just want to talk about. So, what map does, it actually returns a new list with the values in it. For each does not return anything, it just, it's like a for loop, which is an easier way of writing a for loop. And uh, if you are in, if you program JavaScript, do not use uh, the for colon loop because it messes up things, so you should be using one of these things or any API that provides this because the other stuff looks into places which it does not need to look into and cause a lot of problems. Uh, okay, so now what happens is we have the I think an interesting list of results. Okay. Which unfortunately gets picked twice. I'm not sure why I think I guess I'll change this here, which is the process. But yeah. So yeah, so this is how this this works. Um, and unfortunately, the, ones, the most popular ones are the, the least interesting, as always. Uh, unfortunately, uh, so I just want to give one more example, and then we kind of done here. Uh, so this is, uh, in my opinion, the, the trinity of interesting functions start off in a programming function from them. Um, so map, which you saw earlier, what it does is it takes a list and uh, a function, and then runs that function each element of the list. Now this might seem trivial, and my example here is also kind of trivial, but the use cases tend to come up a lot. If you have a list of addresses and you want these, you want, for example, you want to get the list of the street now, street names for whatever reason, you can then go ahead and filter. Or you can basically go and tell map, give me address dot street name as a list. I'm not interested in other details. So it's it's easier in many ways in terms of thinking because you tend to think in terms of a flow. Uh, if you, how many of you guys have come to the shell here? So if you program a shell, it's called a spiking. So you take data, you take a, uh, the data the results from a particular command, you pass it to another command, and this is kind of similar to that. So you basically take a list, you pass it a command, which is in this case a function, tell it to process each element of that thing, and then return the value out. It's it's a lot easier to think about than actually running about variables and stuff like that. Uh, so it tends to make a code a lot more reliable. I mean, I, it's surprising, but it does. Uh, filter is the is another function which is kind of similar to map. What filter does is basically takes uh, a function that returns true or false. And it only, if you give it a list and this function, it will only return the value that the function returns true for. And all other values they ignore. So, in this, so in, in this simple case, what I'm doing is I'm just getting out the even number by saying uh, return uh, only values where x mod 2 is equal to 0. So only the, only the, uh, the, the even values come out. And reduce is a bit more tricky. So, what reduce does, and uh, this one. Trust me, it's worth investing some time to understand. Is uh, takes a function which take two parameters and uh, basically applies uh, uh, this plus this on everything here. So what it'll do is take one plus two, the return value, which will be three. It will then take the next parameter, apply it to that. So that will become one plus two plus three, four. So it keeps it keeps combining these values up till you get a final result. And which is obviously the sum of the values. Now again, here this is kind of uh, trivial, but there are a lot of cases where you you, you you basically have a list and you want you want to basically do an operation across the values of the list and you want to pass this thing across. So it turns out to be quite useful for us as well. 
Okay, so that's about it. Uh, any questions? Anything? Any, sorry. Uh, any questions at all? Uh, did, did, did it make sense? Uh, I think I should ask that first. Uh, because you guys are incredibly quiet. <laughs> so just be free. I mean, did it make sense? Just let me know and I can try and explain. <clears throat> what uh, do you recommend people go and read and look up to find out more about functional programming in JavaScript? So, unfortunately there isn't much right now. What I'd suggest you do is actually pick up underscore.js and just start playing with it. Uh, there's really not much need to spend too much time. Uh, the one of the risks of functional programming, you have this huge group of people who are functional programming experts who tend to conflate functional programming with mathematics and that gets, a, gets very boring. So I'd suggest not spending too much time trying to Explore functional programming as a topic because then you get sidetracked with these guys. But just pick up underscore JS or and have a look at what uh, various people are doing with JavaScript libraries, which they're getting used uh, quite heavily nowadays, and see what what's happening. That's probably the better way to go forward. Uh, while using Map, is there uh, like uh, compromises in the performance because for each element it is following the function? So there will always be a compromise, but you're running JavaScript, so there are far bigger compromises you're making. So Map is not going to be your customer. So I'd suggest this is, this is a, 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 a rule I followed, and uh, if you're if, if you're programming, most of the time you realize that the performance costs are not very thick there. So things like map are not going to cost you. I mean, it's more important a lot of times just to come with a sensible algorithm than to actually worry about the implementation of your looping system constructs and stuff. Also, this is now part of JavaScript, so it's going to get faster. Uh, that's definitely what's going to happen. So again, okay, I would suggest not worry. About uh, any other questions? Thank you.